Yeah, rock. Okay. This will not film anybody, don't worry. Um, it's, well, it'll film me. Narcissism in action. Yes. <laughs> Do I have my, oh. yeah. uh, Why does the narcissist want to destroy you? What's the thrill? What's the thrill of the narcissist destroying you? Um, <clears throat> I think somebody asked me this question the other day in, in reference to a discard phase. Um, the particularly savage way in which the narcissist, when the relationship is not working out for them, or you split with them, or they're not getting what they want from you, they can't just say, oh well, that didn't work out, uh, toodle pip, see you later, and off they toddle. They can't leave you unless you're absolutely destroyed and broken. You have to be completely broken by the leaving. And if they do leave you, and you're not destroyed and broken, they'll fucking come back until you are. Wow. They'll make sure of that. And the purpose of that game yeah. is nothing more than a four-year-old tyrant trying to prove to you how important he or she is. And that's all it is. And the, they need you to suffer when they leave. And the more you suffer, the more important and powerful they are. The more you are sad and angry and low and depressed, they feed from that. It's a horrible thing to say to a client in, in coaching. It's really hurtful, but I kind of... I need them to have that um, very graphic sort of impact of like, this is what you are dealing with. It's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a, it's a monstrous entity in some ways, but it's also a very pathetic entity. It's extremely fragile. It's extremely small and petty. And nobody would act in this incredibly emotionally violent way, in a boundaryless violent way, unless they experience themselves as insignificant. Mm -hmm. It's like every time the narcissist does something, they, you know the expression punching up? They clearly feel like they're always punching up, but why? <coughs> is it that they're jealous of the fact that you can feel feelings and they can't? Mm -hmm. Is it that you are a human where they're just a replicant? Uh, maybe, all of these things. Um, but certainly, here's something to note if you've been in a, a narcissistic abusive relationship. In the three to six months after it ends, you should consider the possibility that whatever you're thinking and whatever you're feeling is what they want you to think and feel. Mm -hmm. So if you think and feel like you're isolated and alone and everybody hates you and you have no friends and the world is a dark and dangerous place, mm -hmm. guess who fucking put that message right in there. That guarantees a lack of recovery. If you're struggling to recover, it's because they want to know, I want my ego needs to know that I have women in other places, in other cities and other countries that are completely devastated just by the mere lack of my wonderful presence. <laughs> You're not going to bring up Russell Prand again, are you? <laughs> <laughs> jokes, blood, jokes. I did that. Uh, yes. When you say they are broken, mm. and just, uh, I, I really like the, the uh, example of the shell, yeah. the child, the child's skeleton, skeleton inside. Mm -hmm. I use gross images, don't I? Sorry. No, no, but it's very relatable and visual and memorable. Um, I, a part of me goes, oh, we fix, fix. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's, there's always hope, there's always a chance. And what now I'm going to understand is walk away, there's no fixing, let them be somebody else's problem. Mm -hmm. You know, just, there, there is no fixing. And that's a very hard thing to Yeah, and accept. Sam Bachman has a very good term for this, uh, which he calls malignant optimism. Mm -hmm. Narcissists thrive off our hopefulness and our malignant optimism is what keeps us hooked in. I got a good story about Sam. It's a second-hand story. Uh, a client that I worked with had worked with Sam. And she said, oh, you're much more gentle than Sam is. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, I told Sam my story. I said that I live with a psychopath and we've adopted six children together and I can't ever leave him. And Sam advised me to leave him. And I said, no, I'll never leave him. So Sam ended the Skype session. He just hung up on me, but before he hung up, he turned to the screen, leaned into it, and went, good luck. <laughs> I'm like, that's probably the right method. That's probably the correct way. Like, if you have a client in front of you who's going, I'm staying, it's okay, I'm going to fix him, it'll be all right, it'll be all right. Good luck. Good luck. And then just hang up. Um, the, the malignant optimism, though, uh, there is a, a, a very serious issue behind that. Um, do any of you good people, perchance, know why we suffer from such malignant optimism? No. Let me ask, yes, go on. I think it's because we keep thinking we can please the crappy parent that we could never please. It's like, if we just do this one thing, then I can cure that old one. It's trying to please the crappy parent that we could never please. So, let me phrase it a different way. 
yes, the malignant optimism is that. What my, let's say I have an imaginary client, and what my, my client won't let go of their malignant optimism. And yes, they are still trying to please the crappy parent, you're right. I would invert that, and I would say, what the client is fighting like hell not to lose is their parent. So, literally, when I'm discussing with clients, like, the possibility of an abusive childhood, no. No, my parents were fine. They did the best they could, and my mother was a good mother, and it was hard for her, and my father, he never tore out our fingernails, nor did he burn us with acid. So he can't <laughs> have been abusive. And I would say to them, look, if, if imagine it's, it's you, and I'm a four-year-old, and you see me as a four-year-old boy with a father who is ignoring me. How would you feel? You would, you would feel sorry for me. You would feel empathy for me, and you'd think, that's not good enough. That child is going to be damaged by the indifference. He's not abusing me, he's just indifferent to me. And you would feel empathy for me in that regard, wouldn't you? Can you take that empathy that you feel for me in an imaginary scenario and feel it for yourself? And feel it for the inner child that is inside of you that is still wondering what the hell is going on? That child inside of you is stubbornly holding to the malignant optimism because it doesn't want to lose mummy and it doesn't want to lose daddy. If we accept that, uh, please take a seat. If we accept that the narcissist is the monster that we, in one part of our minds, know them to be, then there is going to be a certain grieving process for your parents. That means your mum was never really your mother and your father was never really your father. They might have supplied sperm and eggs, but they never did the job of loving you. And that's hard. That's tough. And a lot of clients will fight like fuck not to go there because they don't want to lose the, uh, the image they have of their parent. So in the last section, we were talking about the parenting, the uh, malignant inner parent that causes this damage. What do you think the fix would be? What do you think the cure would be to this? Any ideas? Your eyebrows went up, sir. <laughs> That's not the same as putting your hand up, but any ideas how you would fix that? Can you ask that one more time? How would you fix a malignant inner parent that is a superego that is telling you all the time mm. you're a piece of shit and you're useless? How would you fix that if you were a therapist and you had a client? Recognize it. Recognizing it helps. Mapping it helps, yes sir. Building skills within ourselves to realize we're not. Yeah, building skills in the self to real help you realize you're not is, is definitely something you have to do. It's uh, and you use the correct word, which is skills. We have to develop skills and strengths. It's not really a therapeutic process as much as it quite literally is coaching. Coaching to get stronger. Your hand was up. Yep. Well what I what I've been using is like a kind of a cognitive behavioral retraining. When I catch it, I just sort of pleasant Nothing. So when you get the inner critic flaring up, you say to the inner critic, no thank you. No thank you, and can we find another way to say that? Like, you were always wrong, so I feel you were wrong. That time, yeah. You know, that time. And yeah. sort of, it's like a really monotonous, hard, but yeah. really worthwhile. I've been working on it for a while, and it, it's, it brings it down quite a lot. It will bring the inner critic down. There's a piece of advice I'd give you. All, if you're looking to recover from CPTSD and you've struggled, you might at some point find that you need a philosophical shift in your life. That you actually need to study philosophy a little bit and work out for yourself what the meaning of life is from fresh, from scratch. And particularly answer the question, what is love? What does it mean to love? What does it mean when two people are in love? I did this, I did a, a philosophical Objective exercise, what did I think love was? And I thought it was based in the past. Two people guilt tripping each other into a relationship. <laughs> <laughs> Angry and bitter, and who was my model for that? Thank you, mother and father. Um, and just in a game of chess, point scoring, saying who would win. And then I said, well, that sounds like it sucks. Maybe it could be, I don't know, because I've not done it yet. I'll let you know what to do. Present tense, rather than past tense, two people who, they just kind of hang out because they like each other. They just hang out because they like each other. There's no covert contracts, no manipulation, there's no abuse. They just do it because they like each other. And the look of bewilderment on your face is speaking <laughs> volumes. <laughs> I don't know if it's his accent, am I hearing him right? <laughs> yeah, they just hang out because they like each other. 
because there's no other reason than they are just there. Uh, recently in a seminar, I was asked, "How do I pull? But but how do I? But how do I pull love out of my boyfriend?" And I'm like, I, I don't think that's how love works. <laughs> I'm not, a, not, not an expert, but manipulation is the way that many people with CPTSD go because you're not trained to think I'm lovable if I just show up. I have two arms and a head. <laughs> Winning. That's it. That's it. You show up. You're lovable because you're there. Who should be teaching you that? Parents with a baby who's lovable because it's a fucking baby. They're so cute. What the hell's wrong with people? How can you look at a baby and not think anything other than, ah? Oh. Well, but some people can't because they're damaged. So you just show up, you just hang out. And it's not about point scoring or anything that happened in the past or manipulation. It's about two adult human beings moving into a future together. God in heaven, this is madness based on mutual respect to present adults based on mutual respect moving forward together how many of you are seeing loads of relationships like that amongst your friends <laughs> gotta be out there right i'm gonna go to a seminar one day and they'll be like yeah my parents are like that i know loads of people like that this is our model for relationships for most people and it sucks it creates a lot of pain this when you watch tv shows this is what we're seeing Manipulation, covert contracts, Machiavellianism, one-upmanship, point scoring, and being very, very focused in the past, and very, very angry and very, very bitter. You can't win like that. The image that I always use for that kind of a relationship is uh, Gandalf and the Balrog. When they fall, they fall together, and in the story, they fall for three days. <clears throat> and they fight as they're falling, they're like headbutting each other and swearing at each other, and that's most people's relationships spinning into doom and lava and pain. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, I have a question on the relationship. Uh, could, could Before I answer, I am single, so <laughs> <laughs> not a relationship guy. I'll do my best. <laughs> what partner enjoy the masochistic nature of it and consider that happiness? And, not, and how do you recognize? <laughs> Some. <laughs> Some of us indeed could. There's a Nine Inch Nails song called Happiness in Slavery. You would do well to study it. What's that German term? Schaden? Schaden. Schaden. How do you say it? Schadenfreude. Is it Schaden or Schaden? That's his Schaden. That's his Schaden. Schadenfreude. Is that going to be a form of like a, a, a negative joy where you, you feel that? You, you, you think that that's happiness? And so you can, you just I think, I think schadenfreude is where you feel joy for somebody else's dis uh, pain. Are you saying that we feel masochistic schadenfreude for our own pain? In both ways, because you, you interpret that Maybe. as you're happy that way. Maybe. And then the narcissist says, well, that's a great deal for both of us. Yes, we're both so miserable. you remain in that and say, yeah. hey, we're happy. We're happy because we're both miserable, yeah. but I'm in charge of the misery. I'm holding the misery tap. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think there's something like that going on. There's a predator prey. Um, uh, model and um, somebody has to be in charge there has to be a winner there has to be a loser there has to be the false dichotomy there has to be the predator there has to be the prey the winner the loser thing you know the team sports mentality that can kick in and then bleed into politics I'm not here to critique American politics how dare you file <laughs> Englishman yes I, I, I guess culture has something to do with that I mean you know um, I, I think I've probably been guilty of over-blaming culture, as though culture is some alien force that's come down from outer space to dominate us. That's something to do with what? The culture has something to do with what? Culture has something to do with narcissism and the manifestation of narcissism. Right. Gender roles. Yeah. I'm feeling like this might be a trap. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> whether... So then there's, then there's a dominant and then there's a dominant and then there's a recessive, so the dominant projects what the culture should be. So you're saying the woman is the dominant and the man passively receives their dominance. <laughs> That's what you're asking, right? See what I did there? I, I can't hear you, sorry. The, the dominant strength is the recessive we follow and therefore they build their culture from the dominant viewpoint. But she mentioned gender, madam, so well, you're going to have to say it. Gender. Gender. So we're talking phallocentrism. Gender. Meaning, gender. 
gender, <laughs> gender, but the implication, it, li we live in a fallow, we're in America, which is a fallow-centric culture, like, let's not play yeah, games not here, different. that's the implication of what you're saying, right? Mm -hmm. So are you asking me whether I think that's biological or cultural? I would never fall in such a trap. Phil, <laughs> <laughs> you mad? No, I, I have an answer for you. Um, and my answer is, I, I, I took a, too much acid when I was a kid. Too much. I was greedy. I thought it was going to make me better because I had CPTSD flashbacks and I was like, I'll just keep listening to Terence McKenna, reading William Burroughs, taking acid, and doing Zen meditation. And everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be okay. It wasn't, wow. but I spent a lot of time thinking about time and the alien DNA we carry inside of us. Our abandonment issues are a reflection of the fact that the Anunnaki left us here, goddammit. I want them back. I want to go to my homeland. Where is it? Wow, I think I'm in a flashback. Um, <laughs> California, thank you. Uh, so, um, no, the, 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 I would think about things like this on acid. And I think that, you do, you do. You don't just like, acid is one of these things where you can't just look at the wall and go, oh, the wall's cool. With acid, it pushes you. It's like, what is time? And is God time? And if God was time, maybe he's an alien language called time. What is language? People who've taken acid are like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it goes on for a long time, the whole 12, 12 hours, you're like, what is time? And then you start writing notes, and you're like, I'll read this tomorrow. I have fucking solved it. The Bible, the Bible is a code for the alien. And I woke up the next day, and I was like, God is the water, we fall in him. And I'm like, this is shit. This is not... Junk. That was Jim Morrison. No, gibberish. Absolute gibberish. I, I, I suspect that there are like uh, I, I only started with Nietzsche recently, and I think there's, there's there is this drive to power, and there's power games, and there's naughty people who are not very well evolved, and they've realised that power is something to be uh, striven for. So we are engaged, sadly, in a power struggle. And gender, of course, then becomes, in my humble opinion, one of many weapons that we can pick up in the striving for power. But the acid showed me very clearly that the <laughs> difference between men and women is way exaggerated. And it's not helping us. It hurts us because it keeps us separate. And the acid then told me that the whole point was unity. <laughs> Dudes, I am telling you, that's if you take it off, eventually you'll get to a place where you're like, it's all about unity. We're trying to come back to zero. Zero is a perfect circle, man. It's unbroken, man. We're all one. So all religious experience and spiritual experience, if you keep going and keep going, it tends to be the same thing. We're all one. Um, so to answer your question, I think it's grossly exaggerated and the, the, the evidence of that is how much pain it causes and how much antagonism it causes and how it makes men and women want to hurt each other emotionally and physically when we clearly need each other. Did you see the Louis C.K. skit about men and women? It's kind of gross with gross hand gestures, I won't do it. But he's like going, every criticism of a woman is actually sexual frustration. When a man criticizes a woman and when a woman is criticizing a man, the entire time she's going, I hate men, but she's really thinking, I fucking hate men. You know, like, there's, there's a lot of sexual frustration behind it. So what are we doing with our sex drives? What are we doing with our lust? What are we doing with our libido? I mean, Freud was a pretty monstrous guy that you wouldn't have wanted to be psychoanalyzed by, but he was very clever. And he understood that very well. That the, it's, it's a lot of this is about the libido and being a sensible, civilized Viennese gentleman in a suit, but also being a primate. Uh, uh, what did Terence McKenna call us? Or well, was Robert Anton Wilson said we're like shaved, we're, we're hairless primates mm -hmm. in terms of human history. We just off the savannas, we're hairless primates mm -hmm. who were like marching around with cigars, going, "Oh, good day, oh, hello, how are you?" We're inside. We're trying to other. <laughs> unity, unity, unity. So my answer to the to the whole gender issue, and it's a, it's a big one right now, is what, like beyond all the pain and everything else, what are we trying to get back to? We're fighting each other. We're fighting like fuck, probably to come back to a zero state of interaction and unity again. And it doesn't really matter which side of the debate you're on, we're all humans. I know it sounds kind of lame, but it's true. 
You've still got two eyes and a nose and a face and a things and a thing, so you know. Unity man. Next question. <laughs> yeah. Um, would you, like to you have a t-shirt that says I would yeah, prefer not to. Nice. <laughs> nice. Um, One position. Would you be willing to weigh in on what you think 12-step recovery? Um, I, I, I don't know enough, and that's that's not a cop-out. Um, I actually really don't know enough. One thing I would say in the plus side is they ask you to submit to a higher power, and uh, if you want to recover from CPTSD, I would suggest you are going to have to get right spiritually, but I'm not a spiritual teacher, so I can't go there with you. It could be back to the religion of your youth. It could be maybe not a religious experience, a spiritual experience, but you need a why. Like an organizing belief. An organizing belief. Happens. And it should probably be involving the submission to a higher power. I do think that there is a, a sickness in thinking, I'm in charge, we're in charge, we make it okay. Yeah, we should be responsible. But you don't, we don't, there's so much we don't know. We don't know how the molecules go together. I think I've still got the acid thing going through my head right now. <laughs> We're mainly space, you know that, right? Are there any quantum physicists here? We're mainly made up of space, man. Yeah. Vibrating energy, man. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, it, I, I don't think, um, like, try and transcend the pat answers. I'm going to ask you to do something very, very painful and difficult, which is to make your unconscious conscious. I'm gonna ask you to grieve for things that you've hidden from since childhood. I'm gonna make you sad and angry, and then ask you to pay me, because that's <laughs> what I do. To get through all of that, it will help you. It will be a soothing balm, if nothing else, if you have at least, if not a spiritual belief, the capacity to go outside and look at the stars and go, wow, that really fucking helps. <laughs> Humility, thank you. Yes, I could have said it with one word. But I prefer to go on five minutes ranting. Yes, sir. Uh, since we are on the subject of spirituality, I was curious if you were familiar in your experience with Dr. Henry Cloud's work. I politely, while respecting your free will, suggested to you. Well, I, didn't, I didn't get the guy's second name. That's very gentle of you, sir. What, what was his second name? Cloud. Like cloud, cloud, like a cloud. And it, it's good? Yeah, I. My favorite. What's what's the uh, what's a press second second to you. It's what sorry? <laughs> oh bless you. <laughs> you nearly caused narcissistic injury. Well I remember your name. Uh, what, what's, what 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 kind of things is he talking about? Boundaries. Bound oh is it really? Spirituality. Um cool. subjective versus objective experiences like you were talking about earlier. Yeah. How we kinda need to let go of our subjective experiences to gain an objective one so we right. can kinda see the truth. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. There, there's um a never has there been a more timely time than right now for that as a as a message. So yeah, it sounds sounds really, really good. One more question then I need to give you the cure to C P T S D, which is what you came for. Yes. Uh, I was watching a podcast a couple of days ago that you did, and you were talking about self-care. Yep. And you were saying that you would like for people not to be adverse to pain and numb out and mm -hmm. self-care. For me, I related to that a lot because I took care of my a lot of other people, and when that ended for me, I was I was I'm learning, but it was extremely painful to so not take care of myself. And you were kind of joking like, well, you don't have to run and just really be painful to your butt. And mm. it was cute, but I, I said I, glutes. I, You're so good. I don't know. <laughs> um, it, yeah, I mean, it, it, that was for me was like, if it's I'll touch on it for a second. Um, like as I just said, as far as spirituality and religion goes, you need a, philo a philosophy um, that encompasses certain key issues and a religion that encompasses certain key issues. Love is one of them. Everybody in here would do well to take the time out to actually redefine love. What is a loving relationship? Write it down in bullet points. What is love? Write it out. Write yourself a little essay. And. Uh, that um, uh, spiritual and, and, and philosophical approach should embrace um, the capacity to endure pain. Most religion touches on it. Christianity has a bit about it. Uh, so does Islam. Buddhism is based on pain. Um, Hinduism touches on it. You've got to know that it's going to hurt. Um, Stoicism is a good philosophy. I think St. Augustine wrote a lot about this. Expect things to suck. Be grateful when they don't. Mm -hmm. Don't expect things to be awesome and then wins like fuck when they're not. With are inevitably not going to be. The, the, the coded warning I gave before was a cultural reference. Too much entitlement, not enough resilience, mm -hmm. equals what we have today. And this is not what we signed up for. No eternal reward will save us now for wasting the dawn, said Dr. Jim Morrison. Mm -hmm. we, we really have, we've spunked it. We really have wasted 
tremendous amounts of resources on Facebook and Instagram and downloadable porn. But there's no point in being all preachy and judgmental about that. You need to have the compassion to go, well, systemically, we are still primates down for the trees. If we have the option to give ourselves pleasure at the touch of a button, we'll keep touching that button until we go blind. <laughs> so then I then come along and I say, well, you need to wake the unconscious up and make the unconscious conscious, and it hurts. So another part of you after the seminar is gonna go, I don't wanna do this. I wanna watch YouTube videos. Or <laughs> So you need <coughs> a way of Dealing with pain, stoicism is a great is a great tool for that, and it's it's it, there is a resurgence in the popularity of stoicism. So you expect things to suck, be grateful when they're not. That's not how stoicism is defined. If you met a bloke in a pub who was defining stoicism, that's how it would dare. Was your hand up before? Yes, miss. Um, my question is kind of unrelated, but um, I noticed like you never really talk about uh, like the the in friendships. Yeah. And, um, you know, obviously I'm, I'm young, but I, and so I've had about three, like, cluster B, like, for friendships that were really abusive. And, like, when I was, like, 16, I just, like, had this, like, group of me, I was like, you know what? I don't think you're supposed to be afraid of your friend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and I was just like, wow, <laughs> I should have figured out that earlier, but, um, so yeah, it was obviously like, you know, you know, you know, friendships. Mm -hmm. But um you know, I feel like we were really talking about it. Yeah, but, um, a lot of the time is because I, I, n I never have time, but I've experienced that in, uh, in some of my friendships as well. Because, you know, if you have, if you are from that, um, black sheep background <coughs> where your boundaries are broken and you were trained to plant your needs for the needs of others. Yeah, it's not just going to be girlfriends and boyfriends that are hitting you up for that. It's going to be, you know, friends too. Um, and my some of my closest friends from childhood, I realised in later years, were not full-blown MPD, but really sick. Um, I still love them. They're, they're, they're two of the funniest guys I know. They can make me laugh like nobody else can. But they are very mental. They're very. Uh, there's no other way of saying it, they're abusive. Not particularly to me anymore, because I'm not their intimate partner like we, like we would have been as adolescents. Um, but with their wives now, they're not, I'm like, you can't. Yeah. One of them's a withholder, and I'm, I'm looking at their dynamic, I'm going, oh, you, you fucking know what your wife is asking you for right now. Mm -hmm. Just give her what she wants, it's aggravating me and I'm not even in this thing. <laughs> <laughs> Boundary issues. Um, and the other one, he cheats on his wife all the time. No? And uh, he then tells me about it and brags about it. You know, I'm 39. He's 39. It's like, dude, this is it's lame. <laughs> what do you What do you want? You want a cookie because your winky still works? <laughs> um, I think he does. I think if I gave him a cookie, he would be happy. So, yeah, it's 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 the same dynamic. There isn't like sex. Um, sex and gender doesn't change anything. One of the things with uh, the study of nar uh, the study of narcissistic personality disorder is it transcends all the differences you can name, mm -hmm. all the religions. Everybody comes to me and goes, "You don't understand Hinduism. Hinduism is the mo and, and then you get Irish Catholics going, "No, you don't understand. It's Irish Catholics. It's 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 uh, Buddhists from Thailand. Thai people keep telling me that. You don't under you know. So it's not it it transgresses all boundaries. So yeah, you will see it in your friendships. It's a boundary issue for you and also um, you know that malignant optimism the desire for love the fact that you're like I want to connect I want that unity I want to feel loved um, just to head off any questions about why we get into these kinds of relationships let's not kid ourselves human beings live in a state of desperation and they're primarily desperate for love they're desperate to be seen we're all desperate to be loved everybody is that's your baseline state. So you don't need to waste that half an hour in therapy going, but why did I do that? It's like, because, <laughs> because it was there. That's why you did it, that's why you went for it. Let me give you the cure. When you are um, fighting evil, <laughs> how grandiose. When you are fighting evil, my suggestion is not that you fight evil with um, any sort of brawn or strength, but that you try and fight it by flooding it with love. So if you're gonna deal with darkness, just flood it with light. If you are fighting evil and you resist it, what you resist persists. The evil learns your tactics, it strengthens, it becomes more muscular in your resistance, and you actually end up building your own enemies. You create your own enemies by fighting it directly, but you can flood it with love. 
Has that thing gone off? Are you alright? No, it's still, I'm fine. You good? Yeah. I feel for you, man. Pain. Let no me, let me, no let, big deal. Let me, let me check it still. Is it, it is still yeah, it's still blinking. It's going gonna, it's gonna to switch itself off in two seconds because oh. it's naughty. It's this red button if you could start it again. Alright. Um, in, in terms of this, what we have, very, very simply, and I'll make this as succinct as I can, is a recording that is playing out in the brain. I say, I'm saying mind, not brain, because I think it probably is a neural pathway or a cluster of neural pathways that was burnt in with trauma when we were very soft and very vulnerable, when there's huge neuroplasticity with a huge amount of emotion. So psychedelic experiences, very pleasurable experiences, very painful experiences, very traumatic experiences, they burn into the neural networks deeply. And what has been burnt in is abuse. You're nothing, you're worthless, you're a piece of shit. You can fight that, it will help a little bit if you say, no I'm not, don't do that, don't say that, that will help a little bit. But what is better is to actually have another voice coming in where we create an idealized parental figure It can be whoever you want. What was the name of the guy who got beheaded at the first season of Game of Thrones? Robert Baratheon. No, not Robert Baratheon. Yeah, Ned Stark. Ned Stark. Ned. Great father figure. Star right there. Nice Yorkshire accent. Lovely hair and a beard. <laughs> so you create like an idealized parental figure. Um, I can give you the, the, the full way of doing this is on the course, but the essence of it that you can just take home and do tonight is you describe exactly how you would want to be as a parent. What would you value as a parent, whether you have kids or not? If you do, that's great. If you don't, what do you value as a parent? Is it compassion? Is it structure? Is it love? Is it boundaries? Is it strength? That will be a reflection of what you need today. Your best self as a parent is going to give you insight into what you need today from an inner parent. This weird lamppost thing is an inner parent. It's looking over you as you look forward so any internalized dialogue or internalized voice should be coming from the back and above because I'm knee high, because I'm a little kid. So I'm running a voice in my head deliberately that is saying a certain phrase at the moment. But the voice comes from behind and from above. And it comes through in a very, very loving tone. What kinds of things do you think I might be saying to myself? It's too much for me, I can't deal with it. And I'm English, we don't do that. No hugging at the end of this seminar. I shake my hand only, sternly. People do that here, they cuddle. People who come up to me in seminars at the end, they go, and they pat me and they go, hmm. Good. On you go. Um, so, I, 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 I love you inflames my inner critic and it creates uh, resistance. Um, so what I'm going with is you're doing okay. You're doing okay. Everything's going to be all right. You're doing okay. It's good enough. Everything's good. See that tone of voice? It's good enough. It's okay. Keep going. Everything's going to be all right. Everything's going to be okay. It's good enough. Keep going. You're doing good. You're doing good, kid. Now, I know you like that because you've all got wet eyes looking at me now, like this. <laughs> Say more words, put more honey in our ears. It's nice, isn't it? It's nice. That's what you should be flooding with. So I just call the technique flooding because I have no imagination. <laughs> and it goes straight to the unconscious. You go into a very, very light hypnotic state. I, I teach you how to do it in the course, but you already know how to do it. If you just look at the wall and then focus on your breathing and your spine, you are in a hypnotic state. Huh? It's just like that. That is a hypnotic state. As you are, see how you're all looking at me right now? No. So, <laughs> I'll show you what you're all doing. Like, you're doing this, there's very little blinking, and your mouth isn't moving. The mouth opens. So instead of being like closed or moving, like you're chatting inside your head, mm -hmm, you've all stopped doing that, or those of you who are concentrating, and their jaw drops. So you go, mm, mm hmm mm hmm that's how you know people are listening to you and the head stops moving because if there's a lot of internal dialogue people kind of chat to themselves and they go is that true I'm not sure and the eyes are everywhere so you're in a trance out state now you're actually doing this <laughs> you're super trance love yourself now everything will be okay so a very very light hypnotic state and then positive messages but it shouldn't be me telling me I know it sounds weird it should be you as a child remember the inner child 
Remember my inner child before and my superego before? So those two ladies who are up here, that's how you should be imagining it. You're a child now, and it's the, it's the parent is saying it down to you, and you're receiving those loving messages in a childlike state. Do it four or five times a day. Take that pill, take it for a week, get back to me and tell me how fucking wonderful things are. It's really powerful. It's scarily powerful. You drive in the car, you're doing your daily chores, whatever it is, you've got that running in your head, the emotional flashbacks stop. So I've done this in a slightly candid way, but the main point of what I wanted to say to you is that I, I suspect it's actually the inner critic that creates the emotional flashbacks, not external reality. So I've been telling people, and I know other people are teaching this, they say look for your triggers, and it's not really external reality that's giving you triggers, it's the things in external reality that inflame the super ego. That's the trigger. It's the inflame super so, so if we stop this little fucker from going on, we don't get the four Fs. And remember the inner child bouncing through, looking for the codes to unlock the love and the feelings of safety. We just get feelings of safety because you're doing okay, kid. Everything's all right. Just that fast. That's how fast it is. It's not a fucking 10 year therapeutic exchange. It's a hypnosis. You do it five times a day, which is annoying, I know. If you do it five times, you set an alarm on your phone and you just take a minute, two minutes out and you let yourself flood with feelings of love and approval and you just feel good for a minute, but in this way. It's not like an NLP pump up technique where you're like, yeah, I feel really good. Uh. This, is, this is, I feel love. I feel nurtured and I'm nurturing myself. In a roundabout way, I guess I'm coming back around to uh, Louise L. Hay, who I used to listen to a lot in my teens, and her thing was, whatever client she got in front of her, no matter how complicated the problem, it would always come down to a lack of love for the self. So, what do we need to do? We need to love ourselves the way you would another person. And you do that, so I'm suggesting we do it almost literally. So you need to imagine <coughs> You're another person, or you imagine that you're a child with a parent, and then you can flip it. You can be the parent. Pick up the inner child, give it a little cuddle, and go, everything's okay. You squeeze it, it does a fart, and you go, hee, and put it down, and it runs <laughs> off. That's okay. All of that is all good. So you can either parent it, or you can child it. It both works. But you've got to do it, I'd say like five times a day, maybe for two, three weeks, depending on the level of CP testing you've got, for the unconscious to learn a new strategy. The unconscious will always choose the best strategy available. The reason that we've had problems up until now is because we didn't give it another option. Now we're giving it another option, the brain will take this and go, oh fuck, you want me to do this thing that makes me feel really good for the rest of the day? You go, yeah. It's like, sure, sure I'll do that. Whereas the other techniques, they tend not to stick as well because you get the inner critic, the superego, pushes them back out. So you do like an affirmation like, I love myself and all is well in the world. And the superego goes, fuck you, you're shit. <laughs> Stamp. So we go straight, we're hacking the system. We're hacking the system to where the fault in the software is. We want to fix this fault in the software. But it requires repetition because it's a neural network which functions like a muscle. We've got to work that muscle again and again. And then after a week or two weeks, you will forget. You'll forget, and you're supposed to. You didn't fuck up because you forgot. The moment you forget is when your unconscious is absorbing it, and you'll just start rolling forward, and the emotional flashbacks will go down. The emotional flashbacks will start to disappear without any effort whatsoever. Pretty cool, right? Yeah. Because emotional flashbacks suck. They take up time, they alter your perception, they fuck up your interpersonal relationships, and if they go on long enough, they can screw up your personality. So this, is the incredible power our parents have over us as children. This is God. This is God. Every model for God after this, or Goddess, is mother or father. Every religion is mother or father. I was only half joking about the Anunnaki giving us abandonment issues. They shouldn't have turned us into their slaves, okay? I'm not happy, I want my money back, Anunnaki. Um, it is all a reflection of that. Like the, the, all of your religious, uh, the religious stories, if you analyze them as a good Freudian, you'll see it's all there. Daddy's angry with me, he needs a sacrifice, gotta kill my sons. Daddy changes his mind, you don't have to kill yourself. <laughs> um, 
And you get variations of that in in, uh, in, in all of the religions. The the Vedic texts are, uh, are, are cool for that as well. Not cool, bad. Oh, it's dreadful. Dreadful. Terrible amounts of pain and suffering over the fact that parents couldn't love. <coughs> You've got to take control of that. I'm dissociating. Somebody asked me a question so I can reground myself. Yes, make it a weird one. Oh. No, 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 just, just your question, that's fine. Uh, you know, even something like uh, saying, oh, you're okay, my super ego wants to go, no, you're not, no, you're not. Yeah. So you had a trick in one of your videos or something about, instead of saying, you're okay, I'm starting to think that maybe you're okay, like an NLP trick. It's the best way of doing this. Um, that, that will work, the NLP trick will work, and I'll explain it now. The best way of doing this is to actually get into the hypnotic state and you should probably, I have the audio for this, you should let me do it. Uh, I don't want this to turn into a cult, but <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, you're all, you're all primed. Like, if you've been listening to my YouTube videos whilst somebody said whilst they're doing the dishes or whilst they're about to go to bed or brushing their teeth, you're primed for me to tell you things and you just go, yeah, yeah. So use it, don't fight it, use it, have that, you can have that and then that will, like what you're suggesting will work, but this would be probably a little bit faster if it's actually my voice saying, right now, this is what you're gonna do. There's a, a better chance of the inner critic not flaring up. The trick that we're talking about here is where you don't say, um, if the inner critic flares up, if you say, you're doing okay, everything is okay. The inner critic shouldn't because it's not that wild a statement. It's quite a mild statement. Yeah, everything is okay, it's okay. It's not, the, it's not shit, it's not dreadful. It's okay, it could be better, it's getting better. The technique is, if the inner critic flares up when you say everything is okay, you say, I am learning to maybe one day get to the point where it's okay. You use uh, legal language, political bullshit language. Maybe one day we could totally build the wall or maybe something like that will happen, I don't know. The biggest, biggest wall. Next question, yeah. Um, do you think those, those affirmations can help kick out fear? Because I, um my inner child wants justice. I'm not actually calling these affirmations um, because the, the, the primary, and I should, have said, I should have said this before as well, it's the emotion. I want you deep in the feeling of nurturingness, flooded with feelings of approval and nurturedness. I probably didn't hammer that enough. This is how politicians are taught to speak. Flooded with feelings of love and nurture, we will make this human great again. <laughs> um, it's the feeling. The affirmations are good. The affirmations work. Like affirmations are a really good tool. And um, the, when they don't work, it's either because they're badly designed or people don't use them enough. But um, and also the inner critic is an issue. So it's the feeling first. But you're asking if it will kill feelings of fear. Over time, it will. It depends on what the fear is of and how strong it is. Not everybody's coming to. You know, we all are coming from different spaces. What was the fear of? Um, I, my mom is a covert narcissist and she's a marriage and family therapist. And so it just made it all more confusing. But, well, um, I'm, I'm scared by proxy. Yeah. <laughs> she but can't hear call, us, right? Yeah, I need to call her out on her bullshit more. Okay. And I've been too afraid to, but now I'm finally getting to that point where I'm starting to do it. Um, but I, I freeze up in fear. So maybe just, maybe my inner Dialogue, what do you call it? Eye affirmation, but yeah, internal dialogue affirmation. Internal yeah. dialogue could be something like, um, "You're, you're a warrior. You can do like maybe. I guess it depends on what your inner child needs." Maybe. Um, I, I wouldn't say uh, you're. There's a different set of techniques and tools. Um, the reason why I was talking about taking pain was on that day I'd been reading Extreme Ownership, written by a Navy SEAL, <laughs> so I was feeling a bit. Ugh. Ooh, that thing. You are Spartan. It's the Spartan Life Coach. And it's a good book, Extreme Ownership is a, is a really, really good book. Um, warrior in this context, probably not because we're talking to the inner child. And I don't want the inner child to feel pressure to go to war. <laughs> it's just love, it's just nurturing this, and it's not about your mum. It's about you and your, your space. You said that you need to call her out on her bullshit, but do you? Mm -hmm. She's still, she's, um, I haven't gotten no contact. Okay, um, be careful, be careful. They're better at this shit than we are. You have a moral compass, she doesn't. We're two armies, we have the same resources. You have a humanitarian objective and I just wanna fucking kill you. 
I just wanted to add, I found that when I... You just wait for me to... <laughs> The juice is going on. <laughs> Impulse control. <laughs> Impulse control. What is it? Uh, it's okay. Shoot, now I have to remember. Oh, uh, what I wanted to add was anytime I called out even covert, covert narcissists, mm -hmm. I always wind up getting marked for destruction. Mm -hmm. So I agree with your caution. I find it's better to like, bide my time to like. Yeah, um, but bear in mind that like in this context, when somebody uh, says like one sentence. We don't, we don't have any context for like, there might, there's, there's a story to, yeah, yeah. there's something, there's a, you're thinking of a specific situation that, that we're not privy to that might be necessary for you to go to war with it. Um, do, do, be so, so careful, so, so careful, you know that. Um, uh, oh, yes? Yes, you. She says you want to ask a question. I don't know, no, no, it was a question from Some a emotional while. enmeshment going on. She's asking. It was a question from a while back, but you said narcissists won't leave you unless you're completely destroyed. Uh, yeah, generally speaking, yeah. But yeah. you just walk away. Okay. Oh, if you walk away, yeah. they'll be sad as hell. It's like the essence of the book I wrote, Take Revenge on the Narcissist, was walk away and have fun and eat an ice cream. <laughs> they'll be really sad. Be, well, sad is the wrong word they to won't use. Come, they won't come back. Sorry, I shouldn't they say sad to a room full of people. Room, please. Wait, 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 wait. Calm breathing. <laughs> They're not sad. They're not sad. What they experience, and if you are looking to torture a narcissist, a true, like, narcissism is rare. Narcissistic personality disorder is still rare. But the thing that will cause them, they have massive abandonment anxiety. Now, if you're just physically separate from them, that's cool because they don't have ego boundaries. You still exist as like a masturbatory, ego masturbatory uh, phantasm in their, you know, messed up perception of the world. When you are happy without them, you are inflicting narcissistic injury and they will go into depletion and anxiety. That's what I should have said. I should not have used the word sad because it's not sadness. They're not experiencing emotions in the way that we do. On some of the videos I talk about being a shame-based personality, it's not shame as neurotypicals experience it. It's something else. Why do people keep asking questions without me pointing at them? Wait for the point! So, I'm sorry, so sorry. A, flash, a flashback there, it's my control issues. It's all these other people over here. <laughs> I shall shout it loud to you, man. That's a phone response. If anybody asked before. Um, guys, let's take a five minute break, use the restroom, and then uh, come back and we'll finish within half an hour. Thank you so much. Thank you for doing Same that. Same red button? Yeah, please.